At the heart of America is a dirty and shameful reality. Everyone knows it exists. But the devastating impact that is left on generations of people has been glossed over and even ignored, especially by those who still benefit from it. Our American history is rooted in racism. More obvious chapters include the decimation of Native American populations, slavery, segregation, and the Jim Crow era. Most Americans have learned about, or at least heard of these events. But ask them about the eugenics movement, or when homegrown extremists filled Madison Square Garden for a Nazi rally, or how Henry Ford's hatred of Jews helped inspire Adolf Hitler, and you're likely to get a blank stare. It's time to explore these overlooked events that don't make it into our history books and correct the record for the people harmed by them, to trace our past to modern tragedies and learn how folks over the centuries have fought back. We need to confront our racist history so that we might have a chance to defeat it once and for all. I'm Christian Picciolini, a former white supremacist who became an anti-racist activist and a bringer of hard truths. On each episode of F Your Racist History, you'll learn about America's conveniently overlooked racist origin stories. Join me as we yank off the hood and expose the lies behind some of America's so-called triumphs and heroes. Warning. This episode contains historic archival media that uses racist, demeaning, and derogatory language toward people of color, as well as a candid critical analysis of said media that may be triggering for some listeners. We've decided not to censor the language in the context of presenting this as historical information, so as to accurately present the racism involved at the time. Listener discretion is advised. When news broke recently that six Dr. Seuss children's books were being pulled from publication because of their insensitive, racist depictions of certain ethnic groups. The decision prompted a hailstorm of criticism from some people screaming about the evils of so-called cancel culture. Side note, if cancel culture really existed as they claim, you probably wouldn't be listening to yours truly on this podcast, or anywhere else for that matter. We'll go a little bit more into why later. But here's Fox News with their hot take. Six Dr. Seuss books will no longer be published because of what's described as racist and insensitive imagery. There's this cancel culture trying to cancel Dr. Seuss now. How far are they going to take this? I'm fired up about this. I don't know if you are, but my guess is if you had a childhood and you read Dr. Seuss, you might be. President Biden canceling Dr. Seuss. Contrary to the clips you just heard, Dr. Seuss wasn't canceled. And the choice to pull six books from the Dr. Seuss catalog of over 50 wasn't the work of President Joe Biden. The book's own publisher, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, the organization that holds the publication licenses of Dr. Seuss's complete works and manages the image of the late author, made that decision. They issued the following statement on March 2, 2021. Quote, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, working with a panel of experts, including educators, reviewed our catalog of titles and made the decision last year to cease publication and licensing of these titles. They portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong. Ceasing sales of these books is only part of our commitment and our broader plan to ensure Dr. Seuss Enterprises catalog represents and supports all communities and families." End quote. For many people, this decision, which was more of a symbolic gesture since most of the books pulled were already out of print, was long overdue. When former First Lady Melania Trump gifted Dr. Seuss book sets to children's libraries around the country in 2017, a Massachusetts librarian made headlines for rejecting the works because of their racist overtones. The Japanese American National Museum who has long documented these divisive images in our nation's past, issued a public statement cheering the move to officially retire what has now become known as the Seuss Six. So, why is it significant that six Dr. Seuss titles were pulled, all including drawings of racial stereotypes? 
Many people argue that the stories and illustrations are harmless, that the push to remove artifacts like these from our children's early development is, quote, liberal censorship and an erasure of our history. Coincidentally, these are many of the same folks who refuse to acknowledge other parts of our history, things like this podcast hopes to shed light on. There are valid arguments that violence depicted in movies and video games can make some children more prone to violence. If that's considered, why can't the same logic be applied to kids who constantly consume racially insensitive books, cartoons, and other media like music? Does that, in turn, desensitize a child or make them more predisposed to buy into harmful racial stereotypes as an adult? Many researchers and scientists agree that unconscious bias, i.e. prejudice or unsupported judgments in favor of or against one thing, person, or group as compared to another, is influenced by what we encounter during our upbringing. In a 2018 study by Northwestern University, researchers studied bias tendencies in preschool-aged children and through their experiments found that Quote, children revealed a strong and consistent pro-white bias, even at age four. The researchers also noted that children were sensitive to verbal and nonverbal expressions of adult bias. In other words, kids' brains are like little sponges. I don't think it's that far of a jump to assume that if we're brought up watching, reading, listening to, or playing with things that depict white people as strong, smart, powerful, and righteous, while depicting, well, basically everyone else who isn't white as subservient, lazy, criminal, less intelligent, and dependent, or as outright savages, even if you don't consider yourself a racist, you may unconsciously show preference towards white people in your normal life. Throughout the history of the United States and Western Europe, many immensely popular children's toys, books, and nursery rhymes were riddled with racial stereotypes that influenced generation after generation of young children. Maybe even you. Ever heard of Mother Goose? The original story featured a caricature of the main antagonist portrayed as a dishonest Jewish person. Familiar with Eeny Meeny Miny Mo? The original version didn't have kids catching a tiger by the toe. Now run along the play, honey child, but watch out for that bad old tiger. That old tiger sure do like dark meat. Many popular 20th century cartoons produced by the likes of Warner Brothers and Looney Tunes also featured outright racist imagery. In fact, it wasn't until 1968, in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, when some of the most explicitly racist cartoons were banned from being shown on television in the United States. Today, we're going to discuss some of these examples of racist children's entertainment and much, much more. This is episode 10 of F Your Racist History. Racist cartoons, toys, nursery rhymes, songs, and popular phrases. Play is an integral part of our childhood. And for many of us, it accounts for the way we spent endless hours when we were young. Scientists agree that play is vital to our development of social skills, creativity, problem solving, and intelligence. It influences our earliest thought patterns, desires, and opinions. Play is even educational, teaching us math, logic, and interpretive skills. Many children's toys attempt to mimic the culture in which they're made, i.e., dolls are modeled after so-called real life of the time. In the 19th century, however, toy makers' vision of real life 
was twisted into things like the Mammy doll. Mammy dolls were given to little white girls to perpetuate the stereotyping of black women as servants and caretakers of white homes. In popular culture at the time, mammies were typically depicted as an older, larger, desexualized woman with very dark skin. She was, in part, a warped redemption arc for white men during this period. The implication was that white men couldn't possibly find this portly black woman attractive and therefore would not rape her. Layers of problematic toxic male thought here. While in reality, the enslaved women who were forced to work within a plantation home were multiracial with lighter skin, a more visual representation of the sexual exploitation of black women. They were usually of slim build as a result of both their young age and starvation diet. In essence, the Mammy character was created to make white people feel comfortable and safe around blacks and less guilty about the havoc they had wreaked on people of color. Another popular doll during the early to mid-1900s was the Topsy doll. Topsy is the name of a black character in the classic book Uncle Tom's Cabin. Toy manufacturers created dozens, if not hundreds, of different types of Topsy dolls and all of them were based on a description provided in Chapter 20 of the famous Harriet Beecher Stowe novel. Quote, She was one of the blackest of her race, and her round, shining eyes, glittering as glass beads, moved with quick and restless glances over everything in the room. Her mouth, half open with astonishment at the wonders of the new master's parlor, displayed a white and brilliant set of teeth. Her woolly hair was braided in sundry little tails, which stuck out in every direction. She was dressed in a single, filthy, ragged garment made of bagging, and stood with her hands demurely folded before her." End quote. And just like today, children used their toys to recreate scenes that they observed, either in their everyday lives or in popular culture. For example, Secret Garden author Frances Hodgson Burnett once recalled using her Topsy doll as a child to reenact scenes from Uncle Tom's cabin. She claimed to tie the doll up and whip it, its unchanging expression suggesting that Topsy enjoyed it. These are not to be confused with another type of popular racist doll, the Topsy Turvy doll from the early 19th century. These were dolls that are sort of a two-in-one, meaning each end of the doll had a different head and torso that connected at the waist. The skirt is two-sided and flips over to reveal the other doll. Although there are numerous innocuous versions around today, the original depicted a black character, which looked like a mammy, and a more fancily dressed white character on the opposite end. Recent analysis of historical case studies of people who own these toys suggest that these dolls help children internalize the social divisions and perceived racial supremacies between black people and white people. Dolls were not the only popular racist toys. In 1912, Sears advertised mechanical toys that featured, quote, darkies playing the flute or accordion. The, quote, Alabama coon jigger was another popular musical toy that featured a racist depiction of a black man dancing. These types of mechanized toys were popular and used to promote the myth of the happy slave, a prominent stereotypical narrative from the pre-Civil War period. Coin banks, a common present for thrifty young children, often featured the likeness of black-faced minstrel characters. 
As minstrel shows grew in popularity in the late 1800s, so did puppet counterparts that could appeal to the whole family. Particularly well-known examples are the various characters in the Punch and Judy show, especially a black servant character called Jim Crow. Fifteen-year-old schoolgirl Florence Wallace stages a Punch and Judy show for kiddies of the Sydney Day Nursery at Bondi Junction. It's a Christmas treat for the kiddies and a treat for you too if childhood reaction means a thing in your life. I'll have to take you off. <laughs> you dirty old dog. Are you going to come fight me with me or am I going to give you a <laughs> After you fall. Well, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Family games also had overt racial overtones. One game called Chuck featured a stereotypically caricatured black target that players had to toss, or, that's right, chuck, a watermelon-shaped disc at, gaining points for getting it into the wide-open mouth of the target. Ever say you wanted to chuck something? Well, that's why. Carnival-style games like The Game of Sambo and The Little Darky Shooting Gallery involved using black characters as target practice for toy guns. Bowling games like Parker Brothers' Sambo Five Pins featured a racist fictionalized story about a character named Sambo, a derogatory label assigned to blacks after the Civil War, who, quote, was a good old southern darky, end quote. And various card games such as Old Maid, you remember that one, where it often featured caricatures of black women. The advent of motion pictures and television meant that racist depictions of black and brown people also made their way to big and little screens. For decades, Walt Disney Corporation, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM, Looney Tunes, RKO Radio Pictures, Merry Melodies, and even Warner Brothers all produced racist black and white cartoon reels specifically for kids. Old Zip Coon, he's a learned scholar. Old Zip Coon, he's a learned scholar. Old Zip Coon, he's a learned scholar. Sings possum up a gum tree and cooney in the holler. Possum up a gum tree, cooney on a stump. Possum up a gum tree, cooney on a stump. Possum up a gum tree, cooney on a stump. Then over double trouble, Zip Coon will jump. Oh, oh, zip -a Early animations were primarily based on stock characters and included popular, albeit stereotypical, vaudeville and minstrel characters like Zip Coon, Jim Crow, Sambo, Uncle Tom, and, of course, Mammy. <laughs> oh, honey child, what story would you like to have Mammy tell you tonight? I would like to hear about some white anti stepping dwarfs, Mammy. <laughs> well, once there was a mean old queen, and she lived in a gorgeous castle. And wasn't that old gal rich? <laughs> she was just as rich as she was mean. She had everything! Sketches included a variety of racist tropes, including singing and dancing caricatures. The so-called angry black woman sending her good-for-nothing husband off to work. Reenactments using shoe polish to shine black skin. Romanticization of the old southern plantation culture. And false depictions of so-called exotic, savage, ignorant, and sometimes even cannibalistic people of color. Everything I have is yours, your part of me. Yeah, on the child, everything you have is mine. Who, 
The Censored Eleven are a group of Warner Brothers, Merry Melodies, Disney, and Looney Tunes cartoons deemed too offensive for audiences in 1968. The list includes parodies of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and Goldilocks, as well as a, quote, plantation melodrama called Uncle Tom's Bungalow. Since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, Many of these cartoons have been censored or removed from most platforms due to their insensitive and racist nature. As awareness of these issues continues to grow, we must analyze the content we consume critically. And that sometimes means reassessing many of the things we loved when we were young. Like me, Many other 1970s, 80s, and even 90s babies also grew up watching cartoons and movies loaded with racist stereotypes. Hold on there, you no good cat. Just look what you've done to my clean boat. Get up here. In rare episodes of the classic MGM cartoon, Tom and Jerry, there was a house servant character known as Mammy Two Shoes and it was still broadcast on Saturday mornings in the 1990s. I remember her. Other examples include the stereotypical depictions of Native Americans in Disney's Peter Pan. Teach him, pale face brother, all about red man. Good, this should be most enlightening. Uh, What makes the red man red? and the Siamese cats, and the song they sang in Lady and the Tramp. We are Siamese, if you please. We are Siamese, if you don't please. Now we looking over our new domicile. If we like, we stay for maybe quite a while. The character of King Louis an ape, in the Jungle Book, modeled after Louis Armstrong, has also been deemed problematic. There's some debate over whether or not the lyrics of I Want to Be Like You is racial coding. I'm tired, I'm walking around. Oh, I want to be like you. I want to walk like you. Talk like you. The fact that King Louis who is based on a black man, wants to be more human-like and become civilized, parallels pro-slavery and segregationist beliefs that black people were more akin to apes and monkeys in the jungle than to white people in general. Sure, Mowgli isn't white, but he represents civilization, which is inherently linked to whiteness. Other racist stereotypes include the Alley Cats and the Aristocats. Shanghai, Hong Kong, Egg Fu Young. <laughs> Fortune cookie always wrong. <laughs> Not the hot one. As well as the Crows, including Jim from Dumbo. Dumbo, the ninth wonder of the universe. The wild's only flying elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see an elephant fly? <laughs> well, I've seen a horse fly. <laughs> The opening song in Aladdin, Arabian Nights, drew criticism from the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee for these lyrics after the film was released in 1993. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. When the winds from the east... Disney agreed to alter the racist song lyrics and re-released the film with a modification. Here's a disturbing fact. Public policy polling from 2015 found that 30% of Republicans and 19% of Democrats said they would bomb the fictional city of Agrabah from the animated film Aladdin. Nowadays, many of these shows and movies carry a warning statement about historical context. For example, 
Disney's content warning reads as follows, quote, This program includes negative depictions and or mistreatment of people or cultures. These stereotypes were wrong then and are wrong now. Rather than remove this content, we want to acknowledge its harmful impact, learn from it, and spark conversation to create a more inclusive future together. End quote. Other memories from our childhoods don't yet come with a warning label. What about the song that plays from your neighborhood ice cream truck? You might think of this tune as, Do Your Ears Hang Low? Or, a lesser known, Do Your Balls Hang Low? Neither of which, thankfully, mention ice cream. But the original version, produced by Columbia Records in 1916, had a much different tone, playing on the stereotype of black people as, quote, mindless beasts of burden, greedily devouring slices of watermelon. Although the lyrics and title have changed over time, the connection with ice cream is through this racist version of the song. And it was this offensive version, minus the lyrics, of course, that would have been played in ice cream parlors and over Mr. Softy ice cream truck speakers across the country when most of us were kids. Maybe even today. This is not the only common tune you might remember that is tinged with racism. The song most people would know is Ten Little Monkeys. It started out as a song that counted the ways in which young black boys might die, except for the last one, who was somehow lucky enough to survive the brutal rhyming ordeal and get married. It was used as a minstrel song in its original format, as well as the equally racist Ten Little Indians, or Injuns, depending on who was singing it. The tune many of us have used to pick between various options when we can't make up our mind also has a hidden racist lyric. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo" wasn't always followed with catch a tiger by its toe. The original lyric utilized an anti-black slur and suggested a potential hate crime all in one. It's not necessarily a nursery rhyme, but Oh Susanna is often used as a kid's tune. How many of us remember the second verse? Let me refresh your memory. I jumped aboard the telegraph and traveled down the river. The electric fluid magnified and killed 500 nigger. The bolt gun bust the horse run. The once popular kids chant, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, look at these, mocked East Asian immigrants, particularly after the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. The children's rhyme asserts that Chinese and Japanese people were dirty and promiscuous. Several other popular children's stories have dark origins as well. Old Mother Goose, for example, is full of anti-Semitic language and imagery, and the antagonist is depicted as a dishonest Jewish person. Despite scrubbing and reworking of the old story several decades ago, this original version is unfortunately still easily accessible today. Because of a popular 1993 film adaptation, the following example became a favorite of many young American tweens in the 1990s in early 2000s, 
despite being written by a British author over 100 years ago. The Secret Garden, a classic children's novel written in 1911 by novelist Frances Hodgson Burnett, contains some not-so-subtle racist imagery and remarks. When the main character, Mary, the daughter of a British government employee stationed in India, is left orphaned, she's sent to live with an uncle in England. Upon her arrival, she meets her new maidservant, Martha, who tells her she thought the young girl might have been black since she was from India, and that, quote, there's such a lot of blacks there instead of respectable white people, end quote. Mary becomes enraged and declares, quote, natives are not people, end quote. Then, just to hammer home the message with a bit of symbolism, all of Mary's black clothes that she brought with her from India are replaced with nicer white clothes. We've talked about toys, cartoons, and nursery rhymes that are blatantly racist. But what about the less obvious? There are words and phrases baked into our daily vernacular that are steeped in racist history. And most of us have absolutely no idea where they came from. Use the word gypped lately? It's not uncommon to hear the term uttered in frustration in a situation involving cheating or theft. But the word popped up in 1899 as an abbreviation of gypsy, a derogatory term assigned to the Romani people and defined as, quote, a sly, unscrupulous fellow. The term is a harmful pejorative. So, the next time you voice your frustration over being treated dishonestly, try to avoid this term that wrongly equates dishonesty with an entire culture of people. Grandfathered in. This common term is used to refer to someone or something that is exempt from a new rule or context. But the origin of the phrase dates back to the Civil War, when the abolition of slavery and the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments freed all enslaved people and granted citizenship to people of African descent. The problem that this created for powerful whites, however, is that now those citizens, at least the male ones, would be eligible to vote. As a result, a whole host of things like literacy tests and poll taxes were invented to keep black men from exercising their right to vote. But then what about all the poor white men who wanted to vote? These new disenfranchisement measures could very much restrict their ballot access. So, to circumvent any issues for white men, several states passed grandfather clauses, which meant anyone who was descended from a former voter or who had voted prior to the 14th Amendment being passed, i.e. white people, could continue to vote without the new restrictions. The term grandfathered in has become a common part of our vernacular, but it originated as a loophole to prevent white voters from being disenfranchised by laws created to keep black people from voting. Maybe it's just because their origins and the harm that these words and phrases have caused haven't been made clear to some of us until recently, but I hope we're also smart enough to rethink our widespread use of sexist and racist phrases like master bedroom, Indian giver, spirit animal, and whipped into shape, among others. Now that you know, is it something you want your children influenced by? Even the United States National Anthem, which has come under fire in recent years for a forgotten fourth verse, is not free of racist American tradition. As the story goes, Francis Scott Key became inspired to write a poem called The Defense of Fort McHenry while he watched a British bombard Fort McHenry in Baltimore during the War of 1812. The poem was put to music, and the name was eventually changed to the Star-Spangled Banner. 
the lyrics were considered controversial even during its day, particularly because of the following verse. The reference to, quote, hireling and slave pertains to the Second Corps of British colonial marines. This corps was largely made up of escaped enslaved black men who went over to the side of the English after they were promised freedom and land in exchange for their military service. Some historians argue this is a clear jab at the black colonial marines and an ironic glorification of slavery within the, quote, land of the free and the home of the brave. Others believe Francis Scott Key's lyrics are more about defeating the British and aimed at whom he deemed as deserters of the United States, as there were black soldiers, free and enslaved, fighting on the side of the Americans during the War of 1812. The fact that Francis Scott Key was a slave owner and openly flaunted his racist beliefs, a man who thought African Americans were an inferior race, doesn't help assuage the arguments for the Star-Spangled Banner not being a somewhat racist anthem. Another little-known fact about Francis Scott Key is that as the District Attorney of Washington, D.C. in the late 1820s, he influenced President Andrew Jackson to appoint his brother-in-law, Roger B. Taney, as Chief Justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. Don't recognize the name? Well, Justice Taney wrote the Dred Scott decision in the late 1850s, which stripped all freed black people of their American citizenship. Just saying. Regardless of Francis Scott Key's personal racist history, the fourth verse effectively kept the song from becoming the national anthem for over a century until President Herbert Hoover officially named it so in 1931, thanks in large part to organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy. By that time, though, only the first verse of Francis Scott Key's foundational poem remained, since the original was decidedly anti-British, and Britain had by then become an American ally during World War I. Side note, a parade was thrown in Baltimore to celebrate this historic war victory, during which a color guard stood at the front waving Confederate flags. Everything we've discussed today represents some historical aspect of white American culture. And yes, that culture brewed amidst imperialist traditions and white supremacy throughout the 19th and 20th centuries is steeped in racism. The prejudice and racial bias of adults seep into artistic creations meant to teach life lessons to kids. Yes, some of these stories, songs, and rhymes that we've discussed may have been written with so-called valiant moral lessons from the time in mind. But when a child is plied with colorful and wrong images that suggest, quote, white is good and black is bad, or Japanese people are evil saboteurs, or that black women are happy mammies here to serve white children and their parents, etc., that child is set up for a lifetime of bias and prejudice, whether unconscious or overt. And it's time we accept that is exactly what happened. While many of the examples I've discussed in this episode are from more than 50 years ago, coincidentally, making some of them what shaped the foundations of most adults alive today, these songs and stories are the cultural elements that stick with us and shape the society we live in today. They are passed on to future generations. And... While in some cases, they can be used to heal old wounds, they can also be used to inject hatred and anger and incite violence, a premise I'm unfortunately personally acquainted with. It's no secret that I belonged to the white power skinhead movement for eight years of my youth 
in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I was recruited when I was an angry and isolated 14-year-old in 1987. My mind was a sponge, and I absorbed every bit of racist propaganda I could get my hands on. And once I was fully indoctrinated, I began to make my own. After forming a white supremacist rock band, White American Youth, I started writing and producing white power music. I went on to head a second hate rock band called Final Solution, the first American racist skinhead group to perform in Europe. We performed at rallies and festivals all over, but my recorded music was also a very effective recruiting tool outside of those circles. Young people who were just as lost or broken as I had been listened to my songs and lyrics and bought into the racist rhetoric of the neo-Nazi movement because of it. When I finally decided to get out in early 1996, I spent years trying to hunt down and eradicate every trace of the music I once created, but I didn't get it all. Now, with the proliferation of the internet, white power music is easily accessible once again. In 2017, I found out just how accessible my old songs were. That summer, I was contacted by a producer at ABC who had found a post made in a white supremacist forum by neo-Nazi terrorist Dylan Roof four months before he killed nine people in the Charleston Mother Emanuel Church Massacre on June 17, 2015. Roof had posted lyrics to a white power song he'd heard, and he wanted to know who the artist was and how he could get his hands on a copy of the full album. It turns out, I authored those lyrics. The realization that I made something that may have somehow influenced someone to murder nine innocent people is almost more than I can bear. But it's the reality. Rather than deny it, I acknowledge this. I believe redemption without accountability is just another form of privilege and I choose to hold myself accountable. My point is this. The things we create, the things we say, have power, for good and for bad. And they can't simply be erased or forgotten. The stories and songs that we share with our kids and young people influence them in more ways than we can understand. And it's our responsibility to ourselves and each other to ensure equality for all from the start. Racism isn't a core value we're born with. We have to learn to hate and judge others for the way they look, who they love, or where they're from. Unfortunately, while our American ancestors have been great at many things, they've also been very good at indoctrinating us and our children with ideas that are plagued with white supremacist themes. And many of us are predisposed to show bias in favor of white people. And a lot of that has to do with what we encountered when we were young. Are we still passing this along to our children today? If we just ignore it, will the damage it has already caused just go away? What will it do to future generations? Old habits die hard. Even when people illuminate the racist nature of some of these works, resistance is enormous. Think of the backlash to Dr. Seuss Enterprises making the decision to pull some of the pieces in their collection from publication, for example. But we have to be diligent in the face of resistance so we can stop the intergenerational cycle of perpetuating racism and bigotry. Building a truly inclusive and equitable society must start with recognizing the harm certain language and images carry, and then doing the work of unlearning, as my friend Dr. Bernice King likes to call it, the biased ideas that reside within us. Unlearning, in fact, is calling on all of us, and I mean each and every one of us, 
regardless of our race, nationality, and ethnicity, to dismantle false, inaccurate, and harmful information, and replace these thoughts with truth and accurate history that elevates our abilities to understand the painful truths, rich truths, and even triumphs of the past. Unlearning challenges each of us to do our personal and collective work to unlock our own biases or beliefs that keep us from justice, equity, and agape love. That's all for today. Join me next time as we shine a light on another shameful chapter of our country's racist past. We can't beat the problem if we can't see it. You've been listening to F Your Racist History. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and rate us on whichever platform you listen on. It helps. You can get more information on this and other episodes at FYourRacistHistory.com or on your favorite podcast app. F Your Racist History is produced by Gold Mill Group and distributed by Sounder. This episode was researched, fact-checked, and written by Maggie Coomer and Jasmine Brand. Links to source material and references are included in the show notes. Our editor is Ken Pendola. Music is courtesy of Flatfoot56. Jamie Moeller is our producer. And I'm the executive producer and your host, Christian Picciolini. Thank you for joining. See you next time. And as always, 